Welcome to Echocardiography Lecture Series. Aortic valve pathology is commonly encountered in echocardiography lab. Intervention decision will be made usually based on the echo report. So let's provide as much accurate as possible echo report. So let's begin. This is aortic valve lecture part one where we're going to discuss the aortic valve anatomy, aortic stenosis, and the etiology behind aortic stenosis. The aortic valve is a complex structure. It has three cusps. Each cusp is separated from the other one by a slit-like opening. We call it a commissure. So we have three commissures. Also, at the base of the cusp, there is an outpouching. We call it sinus of Valsalva. So we have three sinuses. Two of those sinuses, they have the ostium of coronary artery. The left coronary artery ostium is found in the left coronary sinus of Valsalva. The right coronary uh, ostium is found in the right coronary sinus of Valsalva. And accordingly, we have the name of the coronary cusp. So we have the left coronary cusp, which uh, in front of the uh, uh, left coronary sinus of Valsalva. Similarly, the right coronary cusp is in front of the uh, right coronary uh, sinus of Valsalva. And the non-coronary cusp, it has no coronary ostium. At the meeting point of all three uh, cusps, Sometimes we can see a thickening, we call it node of Arantes, which is a normal finding. Divided by two. Now let's try to identify uh, the aortic valve cusp. In the parasternal long axis uh, view, this is the RV, and it's the RVOT part of the RV. So the, the, corona, the, the aortic cusp near the RV is the right coronary cusp. The one away from the RV can be either the non-coronary cusp, which is the most common, or in uh, less frequency, the left coronary cusp. In short axis, we have also the RVOT and uh, the coronary or the aortic cusp in front of the RVOT is the right coronary cusp. Then we have to look at the interatrial septum. The aortic cusp in front of uh, the interatrial septum is always the non-coronary cusp. And the remaining one is the left coronary cusp. Now let's proceed to aortic stenosis. The etiology of aortic stenosis, we will tackle the most common ones. One of them is the degenerative bicuspid uh, aortic stenosis as an etiology, and it is the most common in age less than 65. However, on the other hand, we have a degenerative trileaflet valve, and it is the most common uh, in age more than 75. And also a less common etiology of aortic stenosis is rheumatic aortic stenosis. Looking at a vortic valve, it can help us to identify the etiology of the degeneration or stenosis. Degeneration mainly means calcification and thickening of the valve. So we have to look at the valve carefully and we have to identify the commissures and the thickening and calcification. Is it uh, involving the cusp body itself or it's only in the commissure or the valve tips? area is there calcification or not and if there is any fusion between a, a two cusp for example age-related degeneration will involve calcification and thickening of the leaflet body itself here on the other hand if you look at rheumatic it mainly will involve the edge of the leaflet and the commissure. So you will see thickening calcification at the edge of the leaflet as well as some uh, fusion 
between the two leaflets at the commissure, commissural fusion. By cuspid, you can see degeneration at the leaflet tip. Also, if there is any uh, raffi or the fusion site between uh, the two cusp here. We will see in more details in the coming example. Okay, so first of all, we'll proceed to congenital abnormalities and the most common one is uh, abnormal leaflet count. So it can be a bicuspid or unicuspid or even quadricuspid. So normally we have three leaflets, but sometimes we will have less or more and less equal more. Both of them, they can produce a hemodynamically significant pathology. First of all, in order to check uh, the aortic valve, we have to count the commissures, not the cusp. And we have to count it while it's open, while the valve is open, and we will see why in a minute. So a commissure should open fully until it reaches the annulus here. So there is one opening here, another opening here that reaches the annulus, and a third one here that also reaches the annulus. So we have three commissures that reaches the aortic annulus. So this is a tri-leaflet, three commissures. In this example, you will see a bicuspid aortic valve. However, if you look at the valve in its closed position here, most likely you will say this is a tri-leaflet, which is wrong. It's a bicuspid. This is why we say you have to see it only while it's open. You can see here there is a fusion between the right coronary cusp here and the non-coronary cusp. And the line of fusion, sometimes we can see it, and we call it a raffi. So again, we count the commissures that fully opens and reaches the annulus. This is a tri-leaflet. We have one fully opened commissure, two and three. By cuspid, we can have one and two only fully opened commissures. Uh, unicuspid, we count also the commissure. We see only one that fully opens and reaches the annulus. Quadricuspid, if we count them, one, two, three, and four. So count the commissures that are fully open. This is an example of a unicuspid valve. If you look at the valve when it's fully open, you will find that there is only one commissure that fully opens and reaches um, the aortic annulus. Sometimes we have no commissures. You will have the valve like this and the opening like this. We call it a commissure. This is an example of quadricuspid aortic valve. If you also count the commissures, you will find that there are four while the valve is, uh, is fully open. One, two, three, and four fully open commissures. So after identifying a bicuspid aortic valve, then we have to classify it utilizing either the conventional, little bit more complex classification or the dichotomous, more simple uh, sort of classification. The conventional classification has four types. Type 1 is the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp fusion. So we have to identify a raffi between uh, the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp. If there is no raffi, then we have to identify both coronary arteries arising from a single cusp. Type 2, where we have the right coronary cusp and non-coronary cusp fused, and again, we have to identify the fused cusp by a raffi. In type 3, which is a less common one, there is a, a, a 
left coronary cusp fusion with the non-coronary cusp fusion and again we have to identify the RAFI between them. If we don't see a RAFI then it can be type 4 where we have the non-coronary cusp is fused with either the left like in this example left coronary cusp or is fused with the right in this example. Sometimes we cannot identify the nun is fused with which, so we call it type 4. Now going to the le uh, less complex uh, classification is the dichotomous classification. So it has either the coronicus fusion or the mixed coronary uh, fusion, only two types. In the coronary cusp fusion, the opening of the aortic valve is more horizontally oriented. So we call it coronary cusp fusion. Um, the, the mixed coronary fusion, it has a more of vertical or vertically oriented opening of aortic valve. One would ask why we should bother about this uh, classification. The answer is in mixed type, it is more associated with hemodynamically significant aortic valve pathology as well as aortopathy. Aortopathy by itself is a known association with um, bicuspid aortic valve and it is more common in if we have a mixed coronary cusp fusion. Anyway, sometimes we have the orientation of the aortic valve in between horizontal and vertical. In that time, we have to try to identify the coronary uh, arteries if we can see both coronary arteries coming from a single uh, leaflet then it is the coronary cusp fusion otherwise it is a mixed coronary fusion let's see a few examples here in this image a we have the right coronary cusp here this is the rvot here so we know this is the right coronary cusp and there is interatrial septum here so this is the non-coronary cusp and this is arafi so RCC or the right coronary cusp is fused with a non-coronary cusp. So it is type 2 of the conventional classification or uh, it's a mixed cusp fusion by the dichotomous classification. In this example B, it's a type 4. How? Because we don't have a RAFI, we don't see a RAFI and uh, this is the RV. OT here, so this is the RV, so this is the place of the uh, coronary, uh, right coronary cusp, and this is the interatrial septum here, so we know this is the huge cusp here, so must be fusion between the right coronary cusp and the non coronary cusp here. And this is the small one here is the left coronary cusp. In the example C, we have a fusion between the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp. This is the non-coronary cusp and the interatrial septum is here. We don't have a RAFI, however. So we call it type 1 by the conventional classification, but we don't see a RAFI, but we see a coronary artery here. So this is the area of uh, left coronary cusp and this is definitely the area of the right coronary cusp. This is the RVOT here. Okay. Uh, also, it is uh, by, by the dichotomous classification, it is the coronary cusp fusion. CCF. It's fusion between the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp. If you notice, it's a little bit, little bit between horizontal and uh, a vertical. This is why I just said we have to make sure and to utilize la the landmarks like RVOT as well as if we have any coronaries here and the interatrial septum. In this example D, we have a fusion between the right coronary cusp and the left coronary cusp and there is a small RAFI here. And this is the non-coronary cusp here. So it is type 1 with a RAFI by uh, 
the conventional classification and its coronary cusp fusion CCF by the dichotomous uh, classification. If we see a bicuspid valve in our echocardiographic study, we have to report few things. We have to report the bicuspid phenotype, i.e. the classification of the bicuspid valve, the ascending aorta, we have to report it, as well as the presence of coartication of the aorta or the absence. It has to be reported because those are known associations. The most common dilatation of the aorta associated with bicuspid aortic valve is the tubular dilatation, where it starts at the sinotubular junction here. It starts here. As we can see here, this is dilatation of the ascending aorta. However, root phenotype, where we have the dilatation here, or the marfinoid type, can also occur in bicuspid aortic valve. There are clues for the presence of bicuspid aortic valve. One of them is doming of the valve itself. If you look at the valve, you will find that the leaflet, they will have a doming shape. They will not fully open because of the fusion, like in this example here. This doming is also responsible for the physical examination finding of ejection click that is found uh, in bicuspid aortic valve. Another clue that can be found uh, easily on M mode is the asymmetric closure line. We see here this is the closure line of the aortic valve. So it will be asymmetrical, not central. So ideally it should be in the center. So if this is the aorta here, it will be in the center here. But we have it asymmetrical toward one side, whether anteriorly or posteriorly. So this asymmetry is a clue for the presence of bicuspid aortic valve. Anyways, absence of these clues does not preclude the diagnosis of bicuspid aortic valve. Moving away from bicuspid aortic valve now, we have to know the term aortic valve sclerosis. If we have degeneration, i.e. thickening and calcification, Without stenosis, like in this patient here, we have what appear to be age-related uh, degeneration. We have thickening and calcification on the leaflet body itself, along with the uh, commissures and the tip of the leaflet. So if we have it without stenosis, as you can see, the valve here, it opens well. We have a good opening, so we call it aortic sclerosis. So by definition, aortic sclerosis does not have stenosis. In rheumatic degeneration of aortic valve, like in this example, we have degeneration thickening here at the valve tips and the commissure. You can see this is the valve tips here. So at the valve tips, we have thickening and some commissural fusion here. It is very rare, almost always, if you have a rheumatic involvement of aortic valve, you will have a rheumatic involvement of the mitral valve here. Also, because we have commissural fusion and sometimes restriction of the valve to open, we can see uh, some doming of the aortic valve and long axis. Now let's speak about stenosis quantification. We need three parameters to determine the aortic valve stenosis. We need the peak velocity, the mean gradient, and the aortic valve area. So for the peak velocity as well as the mean gradient, we have to utilize multiple windows. And we have to take the highest uh, velocity yielding window. Uh, maybe it is apical five chamber, maybe it's apical three chamber. Maybe we use the PEED of probe and we ut utilize the right parasternal as well as the suprasternal. So we have to use the highest velocity we can 
also uh, if we have a regular rhythm like an atrial fibrillation in that time we have to utilize the window that gave us the highest velocity and then we average between five and eight consecutive uh, beats after obtaining the highest velocity then now we have to uh, calculate the mean pressure gradient so uh, we can do it by um, the Bernoulli equation we have the short simplified Bernoulli that we can use to have a pressure gradient uh, also if we have uh, a proximal acceleration or maybe subaortic membrane where we have two level of uh, um, uh, stenosis in that time we have to incorporate the proximal velocity as well as the distal velocity so v1 and and v2 v2 is the distal and v1 is uh, the proximal uh, particularly when the proximal velocity is more than 1 to 1.5 meter per second Pressure recovery is very important phenomena that we need to understand very well. So uh, in pressure recovery, what happens? We have change from pressure energy. So we have a pressure here. When the flow from here goes into a stenotic area, once it exits the stenotic area, we have a turbulent flow. So that turbulent flow, it means that the pressure energy has changed from pressure energy into kinetic energy and if we measure the difference between this area here the pressure from here and here we will find it high because the pressure here is less due to conversion into kinetic energy then pressure will recover as we are going or as the flow is moving in the ascending aorta here in cath lab what happens they will have two catheter one here proximal to the stenosis and one distal to the stenosis here in the ascending aorta and they will measure the pressure difference between uh, that two catheter and then the pressure recovery uh, they will have no issue with pressure recovery uh, in echocardiography we are utilizing the CW Doppler which will measure the highest velocity which will be here in that case between this area here and this area here let me put it in blue this area here so we will get a slightly higher pressure gradient and echo as compared uh, to cath lab usually in uh, this is not significant in native uh, aortic valve it's more significant uh, in uh, mechanical bileaflet aortic valve However, if the ascending aorta here is less than 30 millimeter in diameter, pressure recovery can become significant. So now one will ask which one is more accurate. Is it the one in echo or the one in cath lab? One considering pressure recovery or the one without pressure recovery? And the answer is both of them are accurate. However, the one considering uh, or in the one in cath lab, with no pressure recovery issue is more clinically relevant compared to the one uh, in echocardiography lab another parameter for aortic valve uh, stenosis severity estimation is the aortic valve area so uh, the standard method is continuity equation planimetry does not work very well because of a lot of calcium and uh, that will make planimeter the valve is not very accurate and easy uh, LVOT diameter is a common source of error in that calculation particularly because we are measuring uh, the LVOT diameter in 2D like this if this is the LVOT and we measure the diameter from here to here and then we take the radius and the radius will be squared so a small error will will be squared it will be magnified and uh, the LVOT VTI is a less frequent uh, source of error LVOT diameter is measured in apical long axis and why is that because uh, it will utilize uh, the axial uh, resolution so we have spatial resolution which is uh, axial and lateral resolution 
the one utilized here is the axial resolution which is much higher than the lateral resolution so this is why we utilize this image for LVOT diameter and we measure it around 5 to 10 millimeter away from uh, the insertion line which is the annulus away from the annulus insertion to insertion here so 5 to 10 millimeter away from that so ideally we have to measure uh, pulse wave Doppler in that exact same area but it's not possible to utilize PW Doppler uh, in that view a common source or a less common source of uh, uh, error is having the sample volume here too close to the stenosis or too close to the aortic valve then we will have a turbulent flow so we don't see laminar flow we don't see a clear envelope we call it spectral broadening so it is filled inside we have different RBCs traveling at different velocity so ideally what we should do we bring the sample volume closer to the valve and start drawing it back until we get something like this laminar flow with no spectral broadening as well as if we can see here the closure line but no opening click we can see a closure click but no opening click this is a perfect PW of the LVOT we have to understand that we assume that the LVOT is circular in shape however uh, it is not it's a little bit oval in shape so the equation we utilize for measuring LVOT is the area of a circle sometimes we will get a conflicting result between the area as well as the gradient so we have to, con to take this into consideration uh, one of the advantage of 3D particularly if we utilize uh, the transesophageal echocardiography is we can planimeter the LVOT without any assumption we just cut it here and we see the orthogonal plane and immediately we measure the area without any calculation in rare occasion we don't have a good pulse wave Doppler of the LVOT uh, if we have a CW or continuous wave Doppler through the stenosis particularly if we decrease the gain a little bit we can see two flows one dense flow and one less dense flow so that dense flow here is the LVOT signal and this one is the aortic valve signal this is particularly helpful uh, if we are doing or if we have a patient with arrhythmia maybe atrial fibrillation so in that case we can measure the LVOT signal and aortic valve signal in this in a single beat or from the same beat DVI or Doppler velocity index or also dimensionless index is very important how we measure it it will take out of the equation the LVOT area so we will measure velocities only or VTIs only so the LVOT or the proximal VTI divided uh, by the distant VTI or the aortic valve VTI so LVOT VTI or AV VTI or we can also utilize the peak velocity instead of the VTI however VTI is more accurate so in case we have significant stenosis we will have a lower DVI number for example 0.2 it signifies severe stenosis so uh, maybe we have a high gradient high gradient for any reason for example we have aortic regurgitation that will cause uh, a huge amount of blood to pass through a normal aortic valve then we will have a high gradient hyperdynamic circulation due to thyrotoxicosis or anemia we will have a high gradient but still the DVI will be normal because we will have increase in both LVOT VTI as well as aortic valve VTI so DVI is an important parameter uh, to assess aortic valve stenosis severity so according to the latest guidelines aortic valve can be uh, or aortic valve stenosis can be mild moderate or severe 
we go by uh, velocity peak velocity four or more four meters or more is severe it has to go with a gradient of more than 40 and aortic valve area less than one similarly we have moderate and we have mild and you can see the parameters are here and also we have the dvi dvi below 25 percent is uh, in the severe range uh, more than 50 percent is in the mild range in normal uh, people dvi should be almost equal to one or a little bit less than one so if we have discordant parameters of uh, stenosis severity i.e maybe valve area does not go with a mean gradient the mean gradient usually goes with the velocity because it is calculated already from the velocity but if we have problem in the valve area so we have first to double check for any errors including the lvot area because it's a common source of uh, error we also said maybe we can utilize a uh, direct measurement of the lvot by 3d lvot vti we have to double check and make sure it's a good laminar flow and we have to utilize uh, the peak velocity uh, that we can get so we utilize multiple windows until we get a very good uh, signal and uh, the highest peak velocity should be utilized so let's assume we make sure that there is no uh, measurement error and we still have discordant parameters it can be either a uh, high gradient and velocity consistent with severe but the aortic valve area is low is not consistent with severe in that case we have to consider high flow uh, maybe uh, aortic regurgitation uh, as well as uh, anemia and thyrotoxicosis and dvi here will become very helpful on the other hand if we have a moderate gradient or velocity but the aortic valve area is in the severe it can be either truly severe aortic valve area or it's a pseudo severe so it's likely to be moderate not severe and we're gonna tackle each of them uh, in a minute so let's say we have a um, gradient or velocity in the moderate range and the aortic valve area here is in the severe range first of all we have always to check blood pressure so it's after load so that after load can really decrease the gradient anything uh, more than 140 we have to repeat the whole study when the blood pressure is normal so always check blood pressure before we go into other complicated studies then if we check the blood pressure and we made sure that blood pressure is normal then uh, it can be either there is a low flow and low gradient and uh, reduced ejection fraction also it can have a low flow and low gradient uh, with preserved ejection fraction or it can be normal flow but low gradient aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction and we will see them one by one so if we have a decreased flow and decrease gradient aortic stenosis by definition we need to have aortic valve area less than one i.e in the severe range mean gradient is uh, below 40 ideally it should be in the moderate range ejection fraction is decreased and we have the stroke volume index to body surface area less than 35 uh, milliliter per meter square so once those criteria are fully met then we have uh, option to study the aortic valve which is a dubutamine stress test it's a low dose dubutamine stress test uh, echocardiography protocol i.e we will start low from 2.5 to 5 microgram per kg per minute we increase by five uh, microgram per kg per minute every three to five minutes the maximum we can reach is only 20 and we have to stop after that so indication to stop the dubutamine stress test is either we reach the maximum dose of dubutamine 
or we have already increase of heart rate by 10 to 20 uh, beat per minute from the baseline or we exceed 100 beat per minute or then we have symptoms um, maybe blood pressure will fall down or we have significant arrhythmia then we have to stop uh, or if we have a positive result what I mean by positive result is we have answer positive result can be considered uh, either one of those either increase of the valve area uh, to more than one centimeter so already we have an answer and we stop the test so that means we have in every stage to re-measure the aortic valve area or we have increase uh, of peak velocity or mean gradient to be more or in the severe range so a velocity more than or equal four meter per second or the mean gradient is 40 or more so again we have an answer here that this is a severe stenosis and we have to stop. Or we have an uh, increase of more than 20% of stroke volume from baseline. So now we have, uh, we don't have already uh, low flow. The flow now is normal. So we have to stop and do our calculation to get the interpretation. So the result of the dubutamine stress can be either one of those three options. Either now we have a peak velocity that already increased in the severe range, so four and more, or the mean gradient has also increased to the severe range, and the valve area is still less than uh, one. So this is a true severe aortic stenosis. The other option is we have an increase of the valve area to be equal or more than one square centimeter so this is a moderate aortic stenosis or it's pseudo severe it's not severe and the last option we don't have uh, flow reserves i.e. we don't have increase in uh, the flow so speaking of flow reserve it should be also incorporated into the report if we have more than 20 percent increase in stroke volume we call it presence of flow reserve if it is less than 20 percent it is absent of flow reserve so presence and absence of uh, flow reserve so absence is predictive of poor surgical and long-term outcome but it does not predict the lv function improvement after the intervention so if we don't have enough uh, flow reserve maybe aortic valve area and the velocity and gradient did not really significantly change with the dubutamine stress test, we have other option here to utilize. One of them is the calcium score of the aortic valve itself. So uh, if we have more than uh, 3,000 for a male, we consider aortic or severe aortic stenosis is very likely, and uh, 1,600 for a female, we consider it very likely. It will be unlikely if it is below uh, 1,600 for a male and below 800 for a female. And in between, it will be likely. The other option we can use if we don't have access to um, calcium score of the aortic valve is the projected aortic valve area. So projected aortic valve area is the predicted valve area at a presumed normal flow which is 250 mL per second so they consider 250 mL per second is a normal flow so uh, we utilize that in patient who did not achieve uh, an enough increase of the flow during the dubutamine stress test to have a positive result how we calculate that is we have the aortic valve area the projected aortic valve area and the aortic valve area at rest. This is the change that we got during dubutamine of the aortic valve area, if there is any. And there is also the change in flow rate. Flow rate is stroke volume divided by the ejection time, the LV ejection time. So we calculate uh, the stroke volume and then we calculate also the ejection time from the PW uh, Doppler uh, of the LVOT we measure this time here the ejection time 
and we measure it in seconds so it will be mil per second and then we have the rest of the equation and we have the flow rate here the q at rest which is the flow rate uh, before the dubutamine stress test so if we have initially zero change in aortic valve area that the whole thing here will become zero and we will have exactly the aortic the projected aortic valve area equals the uh, aortic valve area at rest so we need some change of aortic valve area and flow in order to get uh, some sort of uh, result now low flow low gradient aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction so ejection fraction is more than 50 the rest of parameters are exactly the same as low flow low gradient with reduced ejection fraction so we have aortic valve area in the severe range we have a decreased flow less than 35 mL per meter uh, square of the stroke volume indexed and uh, the gradient or the velocity is in the moderate range it's uh, below the severe range the reason for the uh, reduced flow here is not the ejection fraction it will be uh, other condition maybe small LV size for example um, uh, lady with hypertrophy and small LV size to begin with also uh, severe mitral regurgitation or severe tricuspid regurgitation here dubutamine stress test is not helpful and the only thing we can use here is the calcium score by CT scan the final combination here is normal flow but low gradient and preserved ejection fraction so aortic valve will be in the severe range the mean uh, gradient will be uh, below the severe range maybe in the moderate range the LV function or ejection fraction is normal also the flow here is normal so this combination the whole thing usually uh, is not true cannot be true and uh, is very likely to have a technical error here and we really have to double check uh, our uh, echo study so in general if we have uh, a mean gradient of less than 20 or peak velocity of less than uh, 3 uh, true severe aortic stenosis is very unlikely and maybe we don't need to proceed with other tests now as we finished with aortic stenosis we will discuss sub aortic stenosis so stenosis that below the aortic valve so sub aortic stenosis is a rare acquired cardiac lesion with genetic predisposition it's commonly associated with other congenital heart disease uh, including coarctation of the aorta bicuspid aortic valve uh, ASD VSD it can be part of uh, Sean complex when associated with parachute mitral valve uh, supra and supramitral uh, stenosis and coarctation of the aorta so uh, subaortic stenosis can be either a discrete subaortic membrane like this example here or a tunnel like muscular ring which is less common in this example here we have a muscle ridge here so we'll have a tunnel like subaortic valve stenosis so in uh, subaortic uh, stenosis it can be easily missed in uh, 2d echocardiography if you look here you might not notice uh, that there is a, a subaortic membrane so the most important clue here is a turbulence by color doppler that will occur here away from the aortic valve proximal to the aortic valve we have the turbulence occurring here if you look at this example here you will see a turbulent flow that will begin before the aortic valve it will begin here so this is the most important clue for having a sub uh, valvular aortic stenosis just try to find always the origin of the flow in this apical view we can also notice that it can be easily missed the subaortic 
uh, stenosis maybe membrane cannot be seen and the most important clue here is to define the beginning of the turbulent flow here so it begins here away from the valve proximal to the valve so it's not uncommonly seen in subaortic stenosis to have exaggerated aorto ventricular angle so this is the aorta this is the angle of the aorta and this is the ventricle here or the septum so we have exaggerated angle here so this exaggerated angle uh, it will alter the dynamics of the flow and the speed of progression of the subaortic stenosis so any angle of more than 130 degree is a risk factor for a faster progression this is another example of subaortic uh, stenosis with aortic regurgitation so as this high velocity flow will hit the aortic valve it will result into degeneration and develop uh, development of aortic regurgitation so if you can if you look there is a subaortic uh, membrane here we have also the exaggerated angle and we have a thickened degenerative uh, aortic valve here that will have aortic regurgitation at some uh, point the indication for surgical resection uh, of the membrane of subaortic membrane or stenosis is having a significant obstruction with a peak pressure gradient of 60 or more uh, or a mean gradient of more than 40. In children, however, a lower surgical threshold uh, of mean gradient of 30 is recommended and that is to avoid progression in the future. Earlier resection can also be considered in presence of aortic regurgitation in an attempt uh, to, however, uh, avoid aortic valve replacement and more progression of the aortic valve uh, regurgitation. re -stenosis is not uncommon, unfortunately. Thank you very much for watching and we conclude the aortic valve uh, part one lecture and next lecture will be the aortic valve part two where we're going to discuss aortic valve regurgitation